Good morning and welcome to the Design Leaders Podcast. Every day I speak with candidates looking to grow in the world of design, development and construction. I also speak with market leaders at the peak of their career who regularly talk about mentorship and helping the next generation of leaders in their development. This podcast is for those people hoping to learn what the next step in their career could look like. Today, I'm here with James Miner, CEO of Sasaki. James has spent almost 20 years with Sasaki, having moved into the CEO position around six years ago. Over this time, he's guided the strategic evolution of the firm, including rebranding the firm to elevate a collaborative and inclusive design approach, adding new expertise in technology, fabrication, and digital design, as well as establishing a firm-wide research grant program, amongst much, much more. James, I really appreciate you joining me today, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. No problem at all. I always start these episodes the same, just touching on your background and, and you to start off. So if you could, James, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got your start in planning and design. Happy to. Let's let's go way back. Let's go back beyond the 20 years that I've been here, um, back into the childhood days. Uh, I grew up, I always like to tell people, I grew up in Northern California, which which is important to who I am. Um, and I grew up in the Central Valley near Sacramento. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I did not expect that I would be sitting where I am today. I didn't even think I was going to get into architecture and planning as a career. I did, however, watch a lot of television. Uh, those were the days before cable TV was was a thing. So I think we had all of five channels on the on the television that we could choose from. I watched a lot of public television. And one of my favorite shows was Nova, still going strong. Um, but my recollection is that anytime they interviewed anyone who was an expert on anything related to science or engineering, that they went to MIT. So that was my goal in life was to go to MIT because that's where all of the smartest people went, uh, as far as I could tell, and set my sights on doing engineering, more specifically mechanical engineering, with a thought maybe towards industrial design or product design as a career choice. And keep in mind, and the reason why Northern California, Central Valley is important to who I am, if you look at the evolution of California and the history of sprawl across the United States, it's kind of a case study for urban planners in, in looking at what sprawl uh, looks like and does to the environment. And um, I didn't have an appreciation for urban planning growing up in that context. I didn't really understand what it was. Um, but now looking back on it, of course, it's a really important case study for me to understand. So, so that's part of the reason why architecture didn't even occur to me as a potential career path until I got to MIT, which, you know, so that was, that was the goal. Uh, I arrived, I started my courses in engineering and about halfway through visited a friend who was, was doing the architecture program there and just became fascinated by the work that was going on in the studios and decided almost on a whim to shift my focus towards architecture. Um, yeah, so it was it was not a premeditated career choice for me. Uh, and I, that's kind of where it started was halfway through my undergraduate degree at MIT. Interesting. Well, I imagine, yeah. you know, as soon as you got to MIT, halfway through that undergrad at MIT is probably some key milestones in your career path. But if you could describe a couple of other key milestones, key experiences that have helped shape that career path. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick one that happened at the end of uh, at the end of MIT, which is I took a course in environmental psychology, which is essentially the study of uh, the relationship between people and their surroundings, or in this case, more specifically, uh, people and the built environment. And so, you know, I had two years in architecture, and I understood now a bit more about that as a field and what it meant to be an architect, but I had never fully thought about what it meant for people to interact and engage with architecture until I took this course in environmental psychology. That was the second pivot for me, in fact, because it broadened my scope of interest from designing buildings to designing cities and understanding in particular that the buildings and cities and urban environments in general outlive most of us. Mm -hmm. And the way that buildings and cities and campuses evolve and adapt to their users is really fascinating. And understanding that the best buildings and the best cities, in fact, can adapt to change over generations. And so that was 
that second pivot, which allowed me to think, okay, well, maybe not architecture alone, but maybe the field of urban design and planning is something that I'm interested in. And uh, shortly after graduation, I landed my first job here at Sasaki um, as an intern and joined the planning team, which at that time in the late 90s was about, I think, 20 to 25 people. We're over 70 now within that within that one practice group. But uh, that that encouraged me to go back and get a master's degree in, in urban planning. Um, so, you know, a couple of things that just happened along the way, right? I had I had gone to school to be an engineer. I saw I visited a friend and decided to do architecture. I took a class, had a compelling, you know, professor and decided to shift again. And uh, I guess it's I'm always open to new things and, and learning different uh, fields of expertise. So for me, it's always been an adventure rather than a, a, a map or a course or a timeline. Yeah. I like that. I think one thing that I've, I've seen with the, this series is the atypical career route that one would take. So for example, I've spoken with someone who's CEO of an architecture firm who, who, who was educated in journalism, someone who spent their career as a focused construction administrator. And I think that's one big piece to this series is showing people who maybe aren't taking the exact said two routes and showing that you can still end up in that leadership position just like yourself. So I think that's really helpful there, James. On that topic, one thing that I didn't touch on on the last series that I think is important now is challenges and lessons learned. So naturally, there will be people out there who are facing challenges in their career now and, and looking at you know, how to overcome those challenges. And I'm sure you know yourself with a long career, you will have faced challenges yourself. So I wonder if you could speak to maybe some of the more significant challenges that you faced in your career and how you look to overcome those challenges, James. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Yeah, I think the, the key to any challenge is to see it as an opportunity, um, as hard as that might might seem. So, you know, staying on this theme that uh, where I started is not where I thought I would end up or vice versa. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges came for me uh, at the beginning of the Great Recession in 2008. So that kind of started tail end of 2007. I think it didn't really hit the design and construction you know, fields until a year later. Uh, but I, so I was at Sasaki and I, I got promoted in 2008 to, to the role of principal. And I was very, very excited for about 24 hours until it sunk into me that I was now responsible not only for my own career and success on the projects I was working on, but you know, keeping enough work and enough other people busy so that they didn't lose their jobs. Mm. Um, that was a really hard time for most design firms. In fact, you know, there, it was not uncommon for uh, design firms to lose half of their population through the duration of the Great Recession. It was, you know, there's a, there's a whole lost generation of designers. In fact. Mm -hmm. um, that have 10 to 15 years experience because 10 or 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of jobs to be found in the design industry. And so what I quickly realized in that moment was not only was I in charge of um, trying to build up a practice in an extremely difficult time, I was also being put in a position where I was being asked to let people go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we've, we're in an interesting period right now where the economy is uncertain. A lot of firms are going through different challenges. Um, and it's 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 a moment not unlike it was during the Great Recession, though hopefully not as as significant in terms of the setbacks that firms are feeling. I think what I realized, so the challenge, right? Here I am trying to build a practice in a time when the economy's down and also being asked to to you know cut costs and find ways to reduce um our headcount. And I realized not only was I suffering that with that, everyone was suffering. Nobody wanted to do it. And so I, I leaned into it and said, you know what, I, I can do this in a humane way. I can, I can help people transition out and give them opportunities to find jobs elsewhere. And that for me was an opportunity, was a leadership moment, right? Like step in and help get the firm back on track and help us survive the recession. And um, realizing that I was not the only one who was trying to avoid these these situations, but actually leaning into it um, gave me an opportunity. So from 2008 to 2010, we got through this really tumultuous time. And before I knew it, I was on the board and then 
very quickly part of a succession succession plan for our CEO who was planning to retire in 2012. So those moments at crisis, you know, that's when you really have to step in and be part of the team and be part of the solution. And, and if, you know, those are leadership opportunities as difficult as they are, that if you can come through them and be part of uh, a group that's trying to survive or go through a tough time, uh, it really builds your ability to, to lead. I think that speaks quite highly to the culture, right? Because, I mean, we're seeing it now being a recruiter in the market. You know, I speak with candidates all the time and there are some firms out there making quite ruthless cuts. I won't necessarily name anyone, but I think it speaks to the culture in looking at that scenario and, and you know, seeing someone like James, like yourself, <laughs> who's finding a workaround, finding a way to kind of keep those people, keep that culture. So I think that does speak to both your culture as a leader, but also Sisaki in general for anybody who's listening there. And, yeah. and then without a doubt, that 10 to 15 year professional, every firm is looking for right now. And it's that exact reason that there is that skill gap post 2007, 2008, perhaps not looking to enter into the design world. That means there is that skill gap at that level. So again, for anyone who's listening that is at that level, just know you are in demand in the market. Now, touching more on you, know, you as a leader, as CEO in the current CEO position, what principles what strategies have been instrumental for you in driving that growth in driving that success you just spoke to kind of that piece about keeping that culture there back in 2007 eight but now more recently what are those strategies mm. and what are those principles james yeah well i guess i've i've really tried to lean into my experience and and my uh, my own career path has been sort of this me meandering path through my career as a way to really lean into change is the only constant. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I don't, what gets me out of bed every day is I don't want to wake up and hit repeat and do the same thing I did before. Even if from a business perspective, that would be really smart and efficient to say, hey, here's this one thing that I do really well. Let's just keep doing it and uh, generating lots of revenue and profit from that one thing. That for me is not very exciting. And I think mm -hmm. that also at the end of the day works in the short run, but not in the long run. So if you really want to drive growth and, and change and success over the long run, you have to really be a change agent. And you really have to, you have to find people to surround yourself with that have a similar mindset. So it is an example. Um, the firm's been around for a long time. We were founded in 1953. And for almost the entirety of our 70-year history, we were located in Watertown, which is just outside of Boston, but not in Boston. Very important distinction there. Mm -hmm. And we had talked for almost as long as I've been part of the organization, probably even longer, about someday maybe Sasaki should be located in downtown Boston. It just feels like, you know, as much as it was convenient when the firm was founded to be down the street from the Graduate School of Design, you know, being in a city, being more accessible, being on transit says something about who we are as a culture and ethos of the firm. But we always got stalled because most people don't like change, right? So whenever it would come up, there would be a lot of questions. Well, where would we go? What would it cost? What would it look like? Uh, what would it mean for our commute? Um, and so that discussion was really done before it even started. And, and I think one of the really important things that happened for us during the pandemic is it gave us an opportunity to pause and reflect, right? March 13th, 2020, the pandemic is on us and we all went remote fully. And you know, as soon as we figured out how to make that work, we we still weren't back to the office, but we were still in business, right? So we were saying, okay, well, how do we come out of this better than we went into it? And I brought up this notion of moving. Like, why don't we take this opportunity? We're not at work now. We'd already looked at and tested the market for where we could go. This is actually the perfect opportunity for us to pick up and move. Um, and I will tell you the same general feelings were out there, which were, what are all the obstacles? You know, why can't we do it? What what might set us back if we tried to do that? But there were a few who said, hey, that's a bold move. I like it. How can I help? Let's get this done. Those those are the people that you need to make real change, right? And so it's, it's not um, coming from a place, place of being naive or careless. It's more about being confident, actually, that 
um, as challenges arise, you as a team can take them on and we'll resolve them. But if you set yourself in a position where you're trying to predict all of the things that could go wrong and trying to control them before they even happen, you actually can't do much. You'll never get started. It's it, the, the inertia is too high mm. to try and move in a new direction. So um, I think that's it, right? So first leaning into change as the only constant and being accepting of the fact that the world today is not as it was five years ago and will not be in five years what it is now. So we have to change and then finding ways to surround yourself with people who are eager to take that on with you and have your back when you need them as challenges arise. And I got to say, you know, that that happened, right? We moved, it, it, we got through it. We, we have an amazing office here downtown. Um, and within the same time frame, we were able to op open an office in Denver. Uh, we merged with the New York firm and have a new office in Brooklyn. So it unleashed a whole series of things that I think would have never happened because the fear of change was so great and the inertia to stay in place was so high. But once that started moving, the momentum really carried us forward into some really interesting directions. Interesting. I think the, the the Denver obviously you know naturally it sounds exciting being in uh, in, in down, downtown Boston. I think the Denver piece, the Brooklyn piece, and being in New York also very exciting. Can we in the next five years mm -hmm. see a similar transition from Brooklyn to Manhattan, or is it not been discussed yet? No, Brooklyn's part of it's that's our vibe. I think it's consistent with our um, with our brand to be in Brooklyn. <laughs> honestly, uh, we're not a button up. You know, I'm not wearing a suit jacket today. Um, being in downtown Manhattan is not ne ne necessarily who we are. If you visited us here in Boston, you'd see we're 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 in a neighborhood that is right in the middle of everything, but isn't necessarily the place that you might say, "Oh, that's the place you're going to put a uh, global design firm." We're on the edge of Chinatown and Downtown Crossing, but we're accessible to every major transit line, and we're we're in the midst of just this this hive of activity downtown where it's a blend of different neighborhoods mm -hmm. it's the perfect spot for us but um you might find a lot of our counterparts here in boston in the seaport the newest part of town or in the back bay which is you know it's very nice it's luxurious uh so we're a little bit more pioneering and i think you know brooklyn suits us for that reason interesting we did actually uh, make a trip to boston last year to go and visit a few clients and as we walked around that seaport area Everywhere you turn, there is another architecture firm name that got I know on a window. So they all seem to be in the same sort of area. Um, yeah. And then you spoke there about the idea of COVID, you know, having that opportunity for change and, and kind of giving that opportunity there, particularly in a post-COVID world, James. How do you foster a culture of innovation, creativity, collaboration amongst the organization? Mm -hmm. So I think you really need to look at our mission statement, which is very simple. It's three words to understand this and how it plays out at Sasaki. It's very intentionally written, I have to be honest. We we rewrote it in 2018, so pre-pandemic, but it still holds, maybe it's even more relevant today in a, in a post-COVID world, um, to be honest with you. But uh, we used to have a very long-winded mission statement, and it was something to the effect of, you know, Sasaki is an interdisciplinary design firm made up of architects, landscape architects, servant designers, interior designers. Um, and no one could remember it. In fact, I can't remember it. That's part of the problem. So, uh, and it didn't mean anything. It was more a description of what we did rather than who we are. And so we set out this challenge to make a, a new mission statement for the firm that was not only memorable, but really really a bold statement of who we are. So better design together. And you say, okay, that's, that's cute. I can remember that. But but I'll break it apart for you because I think it's, it's actually very important. And we, we did actually debate this language quite thoroughly for many months. But, you know, I said better design. And, and other people say, well, why, why wouldn't we do the best design? Isn't that what we strive to do? And of course, we want to be the best designers. We want to be the firm of choice. But there's a sense of humility built into who we are which is to say that, yes, even if what we put forward in front of our clients today is absolutely the best, we believe it's the best solution for the client, the context, and the kind of work and the, the context within which we're designing, um, our aspiration is to do it better the next time, right? So, so we've never achieved the goal. We're always striving towards something better. We are in the 
the core of everything we do, and that why that's why design is in the middle. We're a design firm. So rather than describing ourselves as architects and landscape architects, urban designers, um, interior designers, graphic designers, it, it, we, we're all the same. We're all united by one thing, and that's design. And the best design and our ability to do better design over time is contingent upon one very important aspect of who we are, and that's by doing it together. So the ideal that the world has held on to with this sole authorship of the architect as the design um, leader, um, that there are individual personalities, um, names on the doors, who you hire or bring on to do a very specific thing that they're known for, is not at all who we are. It's not at all what the world is going towards. In fact, I believe, um, I think there's a there's a power in collaboration. There's a power in curiosity, ability to learn from one another. The idea that uh, good ideas can come from anywhere. The real skill is that actually figuring out what those best ideas are rather than being the author of them alone. So that's where our innovation comes from. We are all students. We are all striving to do more and better. Uh, we're looking for creative ways to solve new problems and we rely on collaboration to get there. Uh, that's kind of who we are. And that's why people come work here because I think they all find it exciting. Nobody here should feel that they alone can do work better than the firm can, right? That, that's that's what gets me excited. I If, if I thought that I was uh, better than anyone else here, I could start my own firm. And some people have. Um, that's, not, that's not the kind of place we are. If you are excited by being around really talented, really smart people, then you work here and learning from one another. That's, so that, that, that's, that's the basis for it. Interesting. I mean, I love the piece of, of you saying there that you're all students. It goes hand in hand with kind of my mantra of, of being a lifelong learner, that no matter how good the design is, no matter how well you've you know, uh, serviced the client, there's always a chance to be better. And I love that there. I think yeah. how do you know, moving now on to kind of, you know, the future vision and, and future goals, what mm. are the primary goals, the primary aspirations for Sasaki in the coming years to the extent that you can discuss it with me and, and our sure. listeners? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so while I want to continue to lean into change, as I've said, I think we can also acknowledge that there's been a lot of change, mm -hmm. not only here, but in the world. And, and so uh, as much as I'm excited about the fact that we've moved downtown and we've opened new offices, that's not the kind of change I want to see continue to happen. I want to see change manifest in, in different ways. And I think everything we've done up to this point positions us well for that. And I guess what I mean by that is that um, I think our practice and, and being in the different geographies that we've now explored, um, I'm eager to see us grow and adapt to what's going on in the world and the changing needs around really important issues that society is facing whether that be around affordable housing, which is a topic in almost every city across the world, um, climate change, certainly in resilience, uh, primary topics, um, as a lot of people are coming to terms with that, what that actually looks like uh, and feels like, because we're seeing this, you know, this happening in real time, and social justice. I think those are three really important topics. And, and I think because we are, uh, we work across the different design disciplines and we work across market sectors, what I'm eager to see is that the collaboration that we've been doing now for 70 years across the design disciplines start to, to transcend to the market sectors and to our clients. So uh, we work across three primary markets. We, we, we label them as civic, which is most of our public sector clients, our commercial, which is our private sector clients and developers and higher ed. We do a lot of work on colleges and universities as well as uh, independent schools. But I think we're going to start to see more of our clients actually starting to become uh, not so easy to put in one of those buckets mm -hmm. um, and forming partnerships to enable new types of projects. So for example, um, how can we enable some of the work that we're doing in student housing and apply that to affordable housing? Um, how can we work with some of our private sector real estate clients to enable some of the smart cities movement and urban technology solutions that cities are looking at to make cities more efficient and livable at scale rather than project by project basis. So I think that's where things are going to go. And I think that's where I want to see us start to work is where 
maybe the traditional funding mechanisms that enable projects it starts to shift. Uh, we open up new sources of funding or resources or, or ways of collaborating to make projects happen. And we start to just see the model of who our clients are begin to pivot and, and transform uh, as we go forward. Interesting. I think I had a couple of questions around this section, but, you know, you've naturally kind of, you know, uh, already answered a couple of those questions about market dynamics and market changes. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to face those changes? But I think and you did kind of start to touch on maybe a couple of projects or initiatives there. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, again, to the extent that you can discuss, if you could share any upcoming projects or Sasaki yeah. initiatives that you're particularly excited about. Yeah, well, we do have one additional geography which i hadn't mentioned because we're actually just getting ready to to launch a pr initiative around it but i'm happy to share it with you here um i was just in la last week actually it's the reason we had to reschedule this call um but um we brought on a, a great pr from there we have a few people already located in los angeles um and that's the, the location where we're going to be opening our, our next uh studio and it's going to start with the opening of there's a new waterfront park at the port of LA that we've been working on. It's having its grand opening in a couple of weeks on February 3rd. We've just won a new commission to convert um, the Santa Monica airport back to a park. Uh, super exciting, very high profile project. There are a few others in the works that we'll be unveiling as we go forward through the year. But, but most importantly, you say, okay, well, okay, Denver, you got New York and you've got Boston and you got LA and uh, why LA? Well, LA is, is for me as much on brand as anywhere that I can imagine in the US for those three reasons that I mentioned in terms of where I want to see the practice going. Um, I think there are really interesting opportunities and challenges around affordable housing, um, around climate change and heat resilience in particular in Los Angeles. Um, and um, social justice continues to be one of those things when we look at the population in LA and how we design for different communities. And I think the design industry is ready to respond. So like, you know, everything we learned in school was very focused on what we knew from history and, and for, for certain audiences. And I think we're, we're all experiencing a change in perspective around who we're designing for mm -hmm. and what that looks like. And it may not look like what I'm familiar with or what I'm used to or what I'm comfortable with. Um, and so I think this this opportunity for us in Los Angeles is very important for us to continue to evolve the practice. I think and even more exciting, we use this platform and this podcast to share that information. So is it originally sure. just kind of, you know, a podcast for discussion, but I guess extra, extra read all about it. Um, Sasaki to open in, in L.A. How exciting a story there. I think yeah. now also. You know, leaning on you for a little bit of professional development and advice, you know, what advice, especially someone who has a background in engineering, urban planning, uh, architecture and design, what advice do you have for young architects, young engineering professionals that are looking to advance their careers? Well, I guess maybe I have two pieces of advice. One is um, something that I didn't do, and maybe one is something that I have always done. So the one that I, that I didn't do it as much when I was in my earlier parts of my career, but I think everybody should, is, is get out and network with your peers. I think maybe there's a lot more opportunities for younger professionals to do this now. All of the professional organizations have young leaders groups and different kinds of social events. Uh, more than I remember, certainly, than when I was when I was coming up in my career. Um, but I think that's that's actually super important, um, especially now with whatever hybrid work situation people have. Um, and I guess it's part of that advice, which is, you know, enjoy the flexibility of hybrid work, but don't fall into a pattern of isolating yourself when you could be working with others. Mm -hmm. And um, I cannot emphasize that enough. I get it. I understand it. I've enjoyed working at home. I've got three kids there. I've got a dog. I've got a really comfortable place to sit. And it's very easy for me sometimes to just spend an entire day by myself. And when I get out and when I interact with other people and go to an event or come to the office or collaborate or travel or whatever, I remember how important those interactions are to my, my not only my health and well-being, but also just to my, my knowledge base and what I'm you know understanding and what I'm thinking about. The second piece of advice is something that I've always done and I, I think everybody should do is, and, and maybe I, see, I my sense is that people don't do it as much, I could be wrong about this, but study your history. 
I, I think there's there's a lot going on. There's calls for change um, and good reason, right? Especially when it comes to climate change and being more responsible about the environment. But I think, especially for designers, study your history, understand the context for why things are the way that they are. Styles and opinions have changed a lot over time. And most of the time, what, you know, the design of our built environment has responded to things that were going on in society and the economy. There are broader influences at play. Mm -hmm. Understanding those, I think, allows people to have an appreciation for that context and history without just being a critic and will allow you to be a better, more informed designer for the things we're trying to do today. But you really got to understand the history. So why is it like that? I want, you know, there's a reason, right? It wasn't just somebody making a bad design choice. There's, there's real context, whether it was designing for cars, which at one point in time was the way, right? I mean, that's, that was definitely a, an ideal situation. Okay, now, given those choices, how do we adapt the environment for pedestrians going forward? Okay, it wasn't just that people were dumb. Uh, or you know, bad designers. It actually, there was a, the real context around it. So those forces are dynamic, and we need to understand them uh, to be able to to move forward. Well, I love both of those. I think on on that second one there, I think that's a piece of advice that can be you know cross industries. You know, of course, we yeah. we discuss you know why design is the way it is, but why do any of us? you know, undertake processes and, and certain types of mm. services the way that we do, understanding kind of where it's come from from the past and, and how we can help it change. I think that piece of advice really does cross industries. And your first point, I couldn't agree more, especially, you know, I'm, I'm a recruiter. I love to network. I'm a big believer of, you know, becoming your own champion in, in a networking capacity and bringing on other champions for yourself. And I think mm. you outlined it there, you know, even as CEO of Sasaki, nationally or internationally recognized firm, you mentioned there that there are days when you come into the office and you still learn. So I think you know, the idea of, of learning through osmosis, being next to someone who knows possibly more about a topic than you and, and just having that chance to learn from them. And I think this is a, a big important point in my role that there are many people out there who are looking for that hybrid or even fully remote opportunity. And, and not mm. many people seem totally open to being in an office five days a week but I, I can be quite certain that in 10 years time those that were around their leaders for five days a week for a number of years they're the ones that are going to be advancing they're the ones that are going to see the opportunities that does not mean that there aren't opportunities for those in a remote position or a hybrid opportunity but just giving yourself the best possible opportunity for a springboard is that networking being around people and learning through osmosis so I, I couldn't agree more with you there well, I'm with you on that one. And I have to be honest, it's hard in my position for people to hear me because I think the underlying assumption for any business leader, when we talk about the importance of being together and in person or whether that translates into a certain number of days in the office is that you're trying to justify the rent cost, right? Or that you're somehow not trusting your employees and you need to have eyes on them to make sure they're working. And it doesn't matter how many times I say this, I think it's that's the underlying assumption, but it's absolutely not that. It is exactly what you just said. Five, 10 years time, all of that investment in being together will put you in a different place in your career. I, and the more people that can say that, the better, because I, I am not a fortune teller, but I, I really believe looking into the future, people who look back and say, oh, I wish I'd shown up, or I wish I'd taken that chance to be together and to learn from other people, I think there's going to be a lot of them. I really do. And it's and it's really coming from a good place to offer that advice rather than, you know, some sort of corporate mandate to get people back to the office. And I think we're in this this funny point where people are arguing about it. And I'm not really sure why. Um, mm. It's too bad. Well, I agree. And, and I think the one piece of what we've seen over the last few years that I would like to stay is the compassion the empathy and the flexibility piece i think maybe a few years ago people were nervous to you know ask perhaps their manager to leave early on a specific day if they needed to pick their kids up from school or they had an appointment and i, I think that is the piece that we ought to keep that compassion and empathy there but the piece that we ought to go back to is is the notion of collaboration 
being with your teammates and, and enjoying yeah. being with your teammates. And I think you can hear from certain leaders in the market, you know, what they're really looking to gain out of getting people back to an office. And I, I do speak with a lot, a lot of them. And then you can hear quite the difference between the way that you're portraying that as well and, and other leaders too. So I think it's all about, you know, the leadership and what they're really looking for. But in total, I would like to see a return to a, an office setting, possibly more than not as well. Moving more to you personally, James, you know, I do want to touch on the person as well and, and not just the professional and outside of work life, if you have any time, you know, what hobbies, what interests do you have that contribute to your overall well-being and your overall creativity? You know, I, I want to start by saying, Jake, I do have time. I think that just to keep in line with what you were saying about this sort of identity and leadership styles and mm -hmm. people feeling anxious about saying, hey, I need to leave early or I need to come in late or whatnot. Um, I think it used to be very in vogue for someone in my position to brag about how busy they are. Oh, you know, I travel all over the place. I have no time. And it's, oh, well, what a leader, right? Um, I said, no, that's terrible. Uh, what about their family? Is that is that is that what I aspire to? And I'll be honest with you, when I was early in my career and looking up and, and seeing people say, oh, yeah, you know, it's I worked 80 hours. I haven't been home for two weeks. And I was like, that's terrible. I don't, I don't want that. It made me not want to be a leader. That's exactly the wrong message. So yes, I want everyone to know I make and do have time for myself as a priority. Um, and, and relative to the flexibility piece, it's important to model that behavior um, for people to make it acceptable. So it's one thing to have a policy, but to actually have and see people doing the behavior in a leadership position is also Super important. So you asked about hobbies. Um, it's on um, this one's maybe not a hobby as much as it is an interest. And it was an interest that I was only able to express during COVID when we were all remote and just getting back. And, you know, before we were fully in the office, um, you know, or, or at least to a part time capacity, I took out the time to coach my son's baseball team. Right. And the reason I could never do it is because practices are always in the middle of the afternoon. And, he, you know, he's 12 years old now, but he was eight years old then. So, you know, it's just going through Little League. And yeah, now I have to leave at a certain time and I have to tell people um, not now because it's the dead of winter, but in the fall and in the spring in particular, hey, I got to go because I got to go coach my son's team. Right. And I say it out loud. I don't try to disappear or sneak out. I need to go because I have to do this thing for my family. And when people hear that, Instead of me worrying, even leadership worries, I think, or maybe I'm the only one, I don't know, that people are noticing if I have to leave early or I've got to do something or if not present. But I but I try to make a point of explaining exactly what it is I'm going to do. And I try to tone back the, oh, yeah, you know, I went to L.A. and I didn't come till midnight on Friday. Um, yeah, who cares? It's not something to brag about. Um I try to let people know that work-life balance is super important. So that's one thing I also do, you know, to re just to go back to my, my, my roots in, in the central Valley in California, I do a lot of gardening. I, I like to um, grow vegetables at home and um, that keeps me sane, gives me pause, gives me time to reflect. So I think having some of those things that you do outside of work is super important, uh, but being involved in my, with my kid's life is, is, is pretty important. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I also love the priority you put on, on saying that you do have time. And, and I think that's where the, the culture is not to keep going back to the same point, but it's where the culture stems from. If, if people hear that from you, then they know that they have the flexibility to enjoy parts of their life and their interests too. And to your gardening piece, obviously, you know, you're, uh, I think, you know, from LA, from the West Coast, I am in New York, don't really have much space, but I also love gardening <laughs> to the point where over the last year or so, I've made like four or five internal terrariums that I've now got in my bedroom, but not an awful lot of space for uh, for any. You don't need gardening. a lot of space. I'd be happy to advise you on that, Jake. To grow food, you don't need a ton of space. It's actually quite surprising. So, yeah. Lovely. Well, perhaps after this podcast, we discuss something separate on on some advice there. Um, and we may have touched on a couple of these, but, you know, final question about you personally, James, mm. can you share any memorable and lasting memories from your career that have impacted mm. your personal life or vice versa, something yeah. from your personal life that has impacted your career? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, this one is quite personal, but, you know, I, I mentioned one of our kids who's now 12. We have three kids and um, two boys. One, on, you know, our youngest is 12. My and my oldest is 18 and my daughter is in the middle of 15. Um, but my my our first child was born in 2005 and he was born very prematurely. He was born three months early. And um, I missed it. I was on business travel. And it was a terrible, terrible moment to have missed the birth of my first child. One of the hardest things I've ever experienced in my life, in fact. And um, well, let's start with the good news. I mean, he's 18 now and he just got an early decision to Columbia. So the kid's fine. He's Wonderful. actually an amazing, an amazing, an amazing person um, and fully healthy. So that's the good news. But we didn't know that. I mean, when when you have a premature child and and children and having children itself is a complicated process as anyone who's gone through it knows um lots of things can happen but you know this kid was born three months early uh weighed two pounds was in intensive care for 10 weeks um we were given all the statistics by the doctors around you know the likelihood of if he survived all of the things that would be wrong with him and i was at a very busy point in my career and decided to travel when my wife wasn't feeling well. And then next thing I know, she's in the hospital and, and our child was being born. And I look back on that as a, you know, it's it's a lasting memory, but it was one that helped me to justifiably reprioritize my commitments mm -hmm. to myself and to the people that matter most to me. And um, I think that's been a good thing at the end of the day. Um, I don't think anyone, you know, when we have a lot of people who have kids in the office, I tell them, hey, this is going to be a wild ride. Take all the time you can take, all, you know, enjoy every moment of it um, and and just remember what matters most at the end of the day. It's not your job. Mm. It's not your job. And if you if you are not happy outside of work and do not have time to enjoy things outside of work, you will not be your best self at work. The idea of work life balance, it doesn't exist. Work and life are one thing. We only have one self. We need to bring our best selves to both work and our lives. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find ways to manage that. Um, yeah. And so I think for me, that was just, that was a really hard moment that helped me to figure out what matters most to me. And um, and it ended up not holding me back, right? So I said, oh, yeah, it was 2005 and I was dealing with a you know newborn who was having all sorts of health issues and I wasn't able to, to work full time and to travel, but uh, but it didn't hold me back. And that's what I was afraid of, right? That what, what would happen now? You know, is this the end of my career? Or am I just going to be stuck? Or, but it wasn't. Um, and I think that's, that's reassuring. It was reassuring for me in my career. And hopefully it's reassuring for everyone else who's listening is that there are going to be setbacks. There are going to be things that happen in your personal and private lives. And they do not need to be barriers to your career um, going forward. Um, so... I think for those that are still listening, you know, I, I appreciate the openness. And and if this were, I don't know if the word silver lining there can really be used, but if there is a silver lining there, I think, you know, clearly your 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 priorities now, the fact that, you know, you, you took the opportunity to coach your son's baseball team, the impact mm -hmm. and, and the culture that you're setting at Sasaki, I imagine has stemmed from that sort of time period so i appreciate the openness there and, and and hopefully there's a small silver lining in that yeah I think yeah yeah as as we come to the end james you know i, I want to make sure that anyone who is still listening up to this point you know where can we direct them of course we'll share your linkedin profile but if they want to learn more about sasaki more about you where can they go whether it be online or elsewhere yeah, the best place to go is our website, www.sasaki.com. We do keep lots of um, content updated there. There, We keep our announcements and our, our new project announcements there. Um, that's the best source for everything. As, as well as LinkedIn, I do put a lot of our content out and, and things that I think are, are relevant uh, through my LinkedIn. So uh, that's a good place to find me as well. Awesome. Well, when we do share this episode, of course, we're going to attach your LinkedIn profile alongside it. Of course, we'll share the Sasaki website. So for anyone who maybe didn't hear that there, you'll be able to see it at the bottom of this um, advertised episode. 
And I can only at this point say thank you, James, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I hope those that are still learning, it's still listening, also appreciate it too. I think we've had quite an open discussion here and I really, you know, the insight that you've shared and I will be contacting you shortly for a little bit of advice on gardening. So I appreciate it, James. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Jake.